are live now. I'll just let this thing load and then we'll start right up. All right. Uh, well, yeah. So um, thank you. Well, working out some kinks right away. I, I, I just told the, the three artists here that I worked everything out. Here we go again. Uh, anyway, uh, hello. Thank you for joining us uh, for the final artist talk in the series of artist talks we've been doing. Um, these talks are in conjunction with our national juried exhibition, uh, Biblio Spectaculum, which includes 33 artists from 12 different states. Um, and all of the, the work in the show is either artist books or text-based visual work. Um, I am Bradley Butler. I am the executive director and curator at May Street Arts, uh, located in Clifton Springs, New York. Uh, I've really enjoyed chatting with the artists uh, throughout the month of July. Um, and uh, these are, are the last three that we'll be hearing from. Um, and uh, tonight we have uh, Courtney Hassman from Houston, Texas, Joseph Lupo um, from Morgantown, West Virginia, and Jacqueline uh, Viola, or Viola, did I get that right? That's like great. The instrument? Yeah, yeah. Like the instrument. <laughs> we'll do is we'll start out by having each. There we go. Oh, oh, great. <laughs> okay. Um, perfect. Um, we'll start out by having each of you introduce yourselves and uh, tell us a bit about your background and your art practice, and, uh, and then we'll each get a chance to talk a little bit more in depth about the work that's included in this show. Um, and if anyone out there has questions for any of these artists, uh, just type them in the comments, and we'll ask those as we go along. Um, and uh, don't forget, you can see this exhibition for yourself. Uh, you can make an appointment anytime through August 7th, which is when the show uh, is over. Um, so you can make an appointment Wednesday, uh, Friday, or Saturday um, during the week. Uh, and you can do that on, on MainStreetArtsCS.org. Uh, you can also visit our interactive site. In, uh, that's interactive.MainStreetArtsCS.org. Uh, and you can see the show for yourself uh, from the comfort of your, uh, where, wherever you are. So if you're at home or not. Um, uh, so uh, that's it as far as the uh, housekeeping things are concerned. Um, so let's get down to, to business here and start this talk. Um, so we're gonna be starting with uh, Courtney. So um, go ahead and, and take it away. Okay, uh, hi, I am Courtney Hossman. Um, I am a ceramic artist in Houston. Um, I got my BFA in ceramics uh, from the University of North Texas in 2016. Um, and I've been working and teaching here in Houston since then. Uh, I make mostly functional work. Um, so, you know, cups and mugs and stuff. Um, and I was drawn to clay for the tactility of the process um, and the functionality of the product. Uh, so I became very interested in the physical human interaction that comes after the piece is finished uh, as a, an entirely new thing uh, for me to explore and consider with a piece of art. Um, so I hand build all of my work. Uh, I don't use the wheel. So um, I do pinch pots. So I start with a ball of clay and then, you know, pinch each piece of the clay to make the form. Um, so my work is about uh, repetition and routine and the meditative space uh, found within that process, um, as well as imperfection and just generally being very human. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> great. And uh, I was, it was a great um, surprise to have uh, ceramics included in a show of artist books and, and text-based work. So that was uh, a real exciting, exciting thing to have two, two ceramic artists in the show. Yeah, I was surprised to see another one, honestly. <laughs> great. Um, uh, well, great. Well, so we'll, we'll hear more from Courtney um, in a little bit when we get to look at her work. And uh, Joseph, would you like to tell us about your yourself and uh, your practice a little bit? 
Sure. Um, so uh, I'm a professor of art um, uh, at West Virginia University. Um, and uh, I am a, a printmaker uh, for the most part. I teach printmaking. Um, and most of my practice involves making prints, making books, um, using the, the gamut of the traditional printmaking methods. Um, and uh, I'm appropri an appropriation uh, artist. Um, so uh, the stuff that I'm interested in talking about um, are things like, or questions that I, I like to ask through my work are like, how do we create meaning? Um, how do we understand what something is or how do we define what something is? Um, and, uh, and thinking about data um, and information. Um, and again, like how do we make sense of data and information? And so for the past like decade or so, um, all of those ideas have been funneled through uh, deconstructing a comic book. Um, so it's this one comic book, it's uh, Iron Man issue 178 that was published in 1982. Um, and while I have an interest in comics, like my work isn't necessarily about uh, like superheroes or comics per se, my, my, my whole idea has been how do we take this this uh, cultural document, right? This thing that we know what it is, uh, that we also perceive it to be finite and concrete. It has so many pages, it has the story, it has a beginning and an end, and what else can we understand about anything from going back into this thing? And then by taking it apart, trying to figure out are there larger questions that I can ask or, um, or things that I can do to make us sort of question our own understanding um, of language, of definitions, of text, of meaning, of information, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so I've done a lot of things with this comic book uh, throughout the years. Um, the most recent sort of bigger project was alphabetizing the comic book as a way of thinking about the text as data. And, uh, and if I present you that data, but in a different order, what then do we understand about a, a story or about narrative, um, that kind of a thing. Um, and so, yeah, so then my current work that's in the, that's in the, the, the show that I'll talk about uh, involves some of that and it involves anagrams, which was another way of uh, manipulating data, right? If the text is data, it's manipulating, it's shown in another way. So, um, so yeah, that's about the uh, sum up of, of what I do. Great, great. Well, thank you. And uh, again, we'll we'll hear more from Joseph uh, on the second round here. So, um, all right, now we're on to uh, Jacqueline. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, my name is Jacqueline, and I am I do a lot of interdisciplinary arts, for lack of a better term. Uh, these days, working a lot with text itself, but trying to uh, put the text to work in differing ways, a lot of different visual ways, even of performative ways, uh, seeing how poetry can sort of come off the page and move out into space. And that's, I really, I feel like it's always a really fertile ground when you're in the relationship between space and the written word. And then they both sort of speak into each other and the whole narrative really seems to shift. So I've been mostly, I write a lot of poetry and, uh, but I'm trying to see how, see, take it like the performative route and see the ways that it can sort of take on embodiment in, in new-ish ways. And I've been, uh, I've been working on my PhD in philosophy for a while. And so have been, two at that intersection of philosophy and poetics and where is that line and how can how can they both sort of put each other to work in really dynamic ways how they can they always be in in dialogue and and I think when they are in dialogue poetry and philosophy then we sort of have these we sort of find these little pockets of truth which is like always a multiplicity and then there's sort of within space it seems to open up all these different pathways which you can just travel on so that's sort of what i've been up to more or less 
Okay, great, great. Well, uh, and we can uh, dig deeper when we when we look at the work that's in this show. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we're going to go to the high tech portion of the show here and uh, do some screen sharing. And um, Courtney, you are back up here. Um, so I've got uh, two two views of of the piece that's in the show, and um, you know you can just kind of talk a bit about uh, about the work. Okay, um, so yeah, my work, as I said before, is about um, repetition and routine and uh, the comfort of doing the same thing that you've always done. Um, so I'm interested in the freedom of thought that is found in um, repetitive processes. Uh, so it's kind of this series of repetition uh, that starts with the process of me making the pots um, and goes on through when the piece is incorporated into someone else's daily life, uh, you know, through the functionality of the piece. So not just hung up on a wall, um, but used to drink their coffee in the morning or uh, share a pitcher of lemonade. Um, when someone buys a piece and incorporates it into their life, uh, every time this pitcher would be used, um, these words that I write on in the pot can be confronted and um, even passively and made a little bit more comfortable. Um, so instead of writing stuff and putting it in a book to be read once and then shut and put on a shelf, um, this feels more like putting it out there, like some sort of a exposure therapy and a deeper way to connect with other people. Um, it's like almost a way of talking to people without actually talking, uh, which is great. Um, so a lot of what I end up writing on my work is kind of a, vaguely honest confessional poems or um, excerpts from poems that I write. Um, and those words are found through the process of me making the pot and other routinely repetitious actions um, like long distance running or driving. Uh, so these are the times that I find myself um, so used to performing the task at hand that uh, my mind is free to wander and think about everything that's ever happened to me or every mistake that I've made or um, you know, just the dream that I had last night that was really weird. Um, and because the words that I put on my work are very uh, personal, I try to make my pots feel um, as human as I can. Uh, so instead of using a wheel, I'm hand building, um, which is a slower, more intimate process uh, so I'm carefully considering each little piece of clay. Um, and by using the pinch process, it gives this uh, strong, hard material, uh, this imperfect softness that um, I think reflects the feelings of the words and imagery put onto the piece. Um, and then using the pencil to write the words and keeping mistakes visible, like the part that I messed up and just crossed out instead of erased. Um, and then that all comes back to uh, the functionality of ceramics and, you know, being touched and held and used to eat and drink. Um, it's this sort of intimate connection. Uh, and these pieces that came from my repetitive routine and carry my personal feelings and thoughts uh, can now be a part of someone else's routine. Um, like for this piece being brought out every time you have people over or with a cup, it might be the one that you fill with water every night and place at your bedside. Um, so then someone else finds a routine with using this object and having it in their home and a comfort from that sort of uh, habitual repetition. Um, and yeah, that's about it. And uh, I mean, how long have you been using text on your on your pots? Is that something you've done from like right when you started doing doing pottery, or is that something um, that kind of came along a little later? Yeah, it kind of came through the process um, because I initially started. Um, you know, most people they go into clay and they start on the wheel just because I don't know. That's like the default for some reason. Um, and so I actually found out that I had tendonitis and my wrists were terrible. So 
uh, that led me to start doing pinch pots. And then, you know, through that process, I found it so like meditative and comforting that this whole other uh, conceptual idea came from it. Cause I initially was more in it just for the functionality of it. And I just wanted to make, you know, mugs for my friends. <laughs> um, so yeah, the text kind of came a little bit later. And I think I started to, as it became more persistent, like I would think of these things while making stuff. Um, I just felt more compelled to put it on the pieces and then, you know, figure it all out from there. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, and uh, let's see, now we are going to go on to Joseph. And I've got a series of, of images prepared as well. So. Okay. So yeah, so this is the work that's in the show is uh, a series of these little accordion books uh, that I, I made uh, as a resident artist at the um, Scuola Internazionale de Grafica in Venice. Um, and that was just last summer. Um, and I also am interested in making like intimate things. You know, the work that I make usually has a smaller size but doing something overseas, doing something that I had to come back to or bring back, um, you know, scale was something that I was really thinking about. So these books are relatively small. It's only about five inches by four inches. And I think when they open, uh, maybe at its largest, it's about 20 inches uh, wide. Um, so I was really interested in making something that had that sort of like small, uh, really intimate feeling. Um, uh, for logistical reasons, but also because you know that the small print is something that I think is 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 really interesting as well. Um, the the text inside uh, the book, there's three uh, talk bubbles um, that has three different statements. Um, here we can see the back. So this is uh, referencing where the the text is is coming from, right? So the original Iron Man book. Um, and then reorganized uh, by me. Um, and then on the inside, there's three, um, there's three talk bubbles. One says, uh, sure, 20 be okay. One says, be okay, sure, 20. And one says, tan, uh, we tan turkeys, obey. Um, and this is another um, sort of progression of, of what I was talking about at the end of, of my introduction, of uh, this idea of, um, using different ways of organizing text and organizing information in order to uh, sort of confuse, you know, confusion is something that I'm interested in, in the, the viewer uh, having, right? Not really understanding exactly what's going on. Um, the idea of presenting them with something that's familiar, something that they think that they can understand, um, you know, almost like tricking them in a way into becoming comfortable. And then maybe the more that they explore something, the more they open this book, the more they look, they look at some of my work, maybe they start to understand that something isn't right here or they don't really get what's going on. Like that is where I want my work to exist. So the first text is the authentic text. It's the text taken straight out of the comic. The second text is uh, alphabetized. So I did a bunch of prints like this, um, where it was an alphabetized, an alphabetization of the original text. What I liked about that, what I think is interesting about today is it seems like we're all kind of interested in poetry. Um, and for me, when I was alphabetizing some of these talk bubbles, they sounded like these sort of poetic, short poetic um, sort of statements. You know, they were like these accidental poems. Um, and again, they kind of almost sounded like they made sense, but then the more that the viewer reads them, like through my interactions with people that were looking at these, the more they realize like it isn't what they were expecting. Um, and then, then what usually happens is that the viewer tries to then make sense, right? To inject meaning. And that's the other thing that I like about, or what I try to do with my work is try to get the viewer to try to create meaning when faced with something that seems nonsensical um, or seems like is devoid of an immediate uh, sort of meaning. And then the last one is the anagram, right? So it's all the letters. So thinking about the letters being data and information and then reorganizing the letters to create a new statement. 
what I like about this is because all three are sort of plausible and I'm not telling the viewer which one is which. I like that confusion between what is the, you know, quote unquote authentic and what is the quote unquote inauthentic text. Um, and so, yeah, so that's something that, that I've been doing. So I did a series of, of these books that also broke down uh, uh, a, 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 a real talk bubble from this comic book uh, in this way. Um, and yeah, and I, I guess the last thing that uh, I want to say about this is that, you know, uh, sort of absurdity is something else that I work with in my, in my work. You know, I think I am talking about some sort of interesting ideas about meaning, um, about information, about how we assume something has meaning or doesn't have meaning. Um, but for me, the way that I like to do it is uh, by also using absurdity, right? It's this idea of by using something that seems comical, sort of breaking down somebody's maybe defense mechanism of not wanting to think about uh, topics like this or issues like this. Um, and then sort of like lulling them in, right? The more that they look at this, maybe the more they realize they're starting to think about things that they, don't, they haven't thought before or, or just by questioning, why would an artist do this? Um, maybe I'm starting to get the viewer to ask questions that they haven't asked before. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's this work. And, and again, this work is just sort of the latest in a, in a sort of decade long um, uh, deconstruction of this one sort of cultural object to try to just see how many different ways I can start to ask uh, these same sorts of questions, but in these different sorts of, of formats. Yeah, that's no, interesting. It makes me think of, you know, what what is real and what is true out there in the world. And, you know, especially in, you know, the age that we live in where, you know, there's information all the time and, you know, people can question the truth of something um, that's totally true and then mm -hmm. believe something that is not totally true. And it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's a wild, wild world we live in. And uh, it's, it's interesting to, you know, that something from a comic book could, you know, make mm -hmm. me think of that. So I think that's interesting. So. Yeah, and I, and I mean, just to really quick to say something about that, my, the, the newest body of work that I've been doing, because I've been specifically thinking about that idea um, about like, especially with information and how we understand information or who owns the information and presents it to us. I've been working with uh, French, copyright free French comics, you know, from the early 20th century. And I've been creating English anagrams of the French text. And the idea is to create this assumption in the viewer that it's a translation of the text, right? But it's really this nonsensical relationship between the two texts. Um, and that's what I'm trying to get at, right? Is this idea of how do we understand or how could we trust the information that's given to us or who has that trust, who doesn't have that trust, who has that authority or that information to present that, uh, that information. Great. Great. And are all of, I mean, the, the work that you're doing now in this series, I mean, are they all the three panels um, in each book? In these books, yeah, it's always this, the same, the same sort of three panel format. Great. Great. Um, well, thank you. And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Sarah has been sharing links to uh, everyone's work that's been talking so far in the comments here. So if you're following along, you can, um, you can find those links below. So, uh, well, thanks a lot. And uh, now we will go on to Jacqueline. Hi. So this series is uh, entitled Dear City, Dear Lover. And it's a series of letters slash poems that are made into posters and then I've been hanging them around Seattle where I live and there's about 45 ish, probably all in total. Uh, so this is one of them. And I started kind of right once like quarantine happened, started these letters, these poems sort of as a sort of thinking through, I've been sort of also thinking about moving. And so thinking through how do you say goodbye to 
what feels like vacant cities? Or how do you say, I think in sitting with a lot of time alone, how do we sort of say goodbye to that which has already left in a sense, sort of like this ongoing dialogue with ghosts? Like we have a vacant city and also like quiet lovers in a sense. So how do we say goodbye to that which has already left, to that which doesn't respond anymore, to that which is quiet? And so it's this sort of this dialogue that is one-sided and yet not one-sided. And so, yeah, so these are, and they also, I hung them all around different spots in the city and uh, sort of to, oh yeah. So like this image here, some of them, some of them are corresponding to text that's like already out in the world uh, and some are not, but this one specifically is. So there's these beach body posters everywhere. I don't, and since quarantines happened, they haven't been changed out. So they've also been like deteriorating through all the weather and looking just more and more haggard as we go. <laughs> it's also sort of like how I feel a little more haggard as we go. Uh, so and putting these posters, which are about hunger uh, and the link between hunger and time and that relational space in between them and sort of putting them out in the city corresponding to uh, our ideas of what a beach body is and the ideas of dieting. This kind of adds a, another layer. And I think in total is sort of trying to play along, play with the idea of sort of how we make maps and how maps also make meaning of our world and ourselves, except these posters sort of are maps which out without a destination or are without like a coherent way to get anywhere else. They're sort of they're they're not they're not instructing you to go anywhere. It's sort of this, you know, sometimes you kind of fall into a a, a poem, like it's a space. Even sometimes when you're like, I'm not sure what this means or what it could be or what this says. So there's that space of the poem that you kind of fall into, which is a little bit not what we want of our maps. <laughs> but that is the way, those are spaces that give us the opportunity to make meaning of our lives and maybe make new meanings or reconstruct. Yeah, reconstruct meanings. So that's the more or less the idea of this project. There I am, no, I'm, not, I'm not muted anymore. Um, <laughs> did you say that you had started this uh, around the time when uh, everything started with the, so this is kind of in, in response to? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. kind of right, like the first weekend of like the first full week, I think of being like quarantined, I hung the first posters especially responding to what is normally feeling like a very busy, vibrant city to now a very vacant, quiet city. And have you uh, seen any reports of, of the work out there in the world through social media at all or? I have actually, which has been, which has been really fun. I've also, I, and some of them have been moving around, which is really interesting. Like I, I haven't moved them, but <laughs> somebody will like post a photo of them and they'll be in a different spot than I hung them, which is interesting. <laughs> it's also interesting to see uh, how long they stay too. And how many do you think you've, you've hung up out there in the world? Gosh. I mean, there's probably 40, maybe 50 total, probably 50 different series of them. I did uh, a few weeks ago, did uh, Dear City, Dear Nation, and then just did Black Lives Matter. And that's the only text that I did, but did that, uh, the text stayed the same, but I hung them in a lot of different places. So the, there was a repetition of message, but in just different spaces, which was, which was kind of, you know, different. And it's, it's been interesting too of the sort of the, as I'm writing them and a lot of the poems or letters come from my own journal entries, which were never really intended to be poems. And so they feel really intimate and vulnerable. 
but it's been interesting transcribing them in the perspective of like Dear City, which becomes this like amorphous blob of many people, <laughs> which is sort of like discharges the personal in a fun way for me of, I sort of am writing this poem on behalf of and acting like we all have this shared sentiment, which we don't, but that just really changes. It's just interesting. Some were like written on behalf of saying goodbye to a city and some were written on behalf of saying goodbye to a lover, but they change from each perspective and that one is sort of implying an I, a me, a singular, and one is sort of implying a whole host of people, which is interesting. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because the way that they, we have them displayed in the show, we've got the two posters side by side and then above it, we've got the image uh, that we also mm -hmm. saw today. And um, when, when they're hung like this, you kind of, you go back and forth, you know, you can see the differences in the text and you kind of like, at least this is the way I read it. You know, I kind of go back and forth and see like, are these exactly the same? No, they're a little different. And it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, addressing, you know, like you said, like, a, you know, a big group of people, the city, uh, the same way you would a lover. You know, I think that that's, uh, you know, interesting. So. Yeah. And it sort of like blurs the line between place and people too of <laughs> what does the position of lover mean versus what does the position of city mean sort of changes all of those what we think are really different and separate really aren't like the one and the many right the many is made up of many singular entities and the the borders and boundaries just aren't they're just a lot more permeable and I think language language does a funny thing of revealing that and also like hiding that at the same time. So sometimes I think the, the letters are so similar, they're just slightly changed, which shows <laughs> languages like that both and, I guess. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, well, well, thank you. And if anyone has any last minute questions for any of these artists, or if any of you artists have questions or comments for each other, um, <laughs> you can uh, share those with us before we, before we end today. Um, but also I wanted to say, uh, this has been, um, this, this talk in particular really kind of points out uh, or points to the reason why we started, why we wanted to have this, this show in particular. Um, you know, we had shown artist books, um, you know, uh, in, the gallery, in the gallery in the past, but uh, for this particular call for work, um, this comes at a time when we are just adding literary arts programming to uh, what we do as, as a nonprofit. Um, and we, uh, late last year, we acquired um, a bookstore. It was gifted to us by um, the vice president of our board, uh, Ann Mencia, and it's just down the street here in Flipping Springs. And um, with that, we decided to, um, to add literary arts programming um, because we just thought it was a great connection. And uh, we, we really got to thinking about the different connections between, you know, the literary and the visual arts. Um, you know, often they're, you know, very thought of as very separate things, but I think that, uh, you know, this show really, um, you know, illustrates that well, that, that they're so connected. And what, what we thought would be a show full of books, uh, artist books, which would have been great, amazing. I would have been thrilled about that show as well. Um, this ended up being a much more diverse uh, group of work that came together and, um, you know, just the, the three of you tonight, um, you know, talking about the variety of, of work that you do, uh, there was such overlap uh, throughout from all three of you. I mean, all three of you talked about poetry. I mean, that's it it's, it's really, really great. So um, really, really happy to, to have you all here tonight. And um, uh, as I said earlier, this is... Um, the last last talk for the show, but the the exhibition does go uh, on for another week, so you can still make your appointment to see the show on our website, maystreetartscs.org, and you can also see the interactive version of the show, um, and that's something you can see forever, um, or at least as long as we have a website. So, <laughs> so uh, this show will, will go on forever. So. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, well, so great. So thank you all uh, so much. And thank you all out there for watching us and listening. And um, we hope you have a, a great night. So uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye.